My name is Ray Jonas. Uh, it's my great pleasure as a member of the Department of History at the University of Washington to welcome you to the second of four lectures in our 2014 History Lecture Series on the Great War and the Modern World. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You, um, I'd like to welcome, in fact, those of you who are here uh, on the main floor and in the balcony. Um, I'd also like to welcome those who are watching in the overflow room uh, right next door. And I'd like to welcome those who will be watching the subsequent broadcast on UW video. Uh, we're very pleased, in fact, to be uh, able to share this sold out series with all of you. And in fact, I'd like to mention that last week's lecture, last, last week's lecture on, um, will be airing tomorrow on Comcast Channel 27, uh, UWTV. So uh, if you know anyone who you'd like to share the lecture with or, or you'd like to see it again, it'll be av also be available online. But the debut broadcast is uh, tomorrow, Comcast Channel 27. A reminder about the format for our lecture. Professor Devin Nahr will speak for about 60 minutes. He'll then answer questions from the audience for an additional 25 minutes or so. There'll be no intermission between the lecture and the question and answer session. We'll proceed uh, di directly then from the lecture to the Q&A. For those of you in the main lecture hall, when you arrived tonight, you might have uh, noticed the, a stack of papers on the table as you came in. Uh, I hope you saw that. I had a chance to pick one up along with a, uh, one of the pencils that were arranged there. If you didn't, there will be ushers going through the room handing out uh, note cards. Those are for questions. So if a question occurs to you as you're listening to Professor Nars' remarks, write down your question. Toward the end of the lecture, please pass those questions down the row, uh, they'll be collected from the aisles and then brought forward. We'll um, collect them and we'll share as many of them as we can with uh, Professor Nor. Now, uh, please take a moment to be sure that your early 21st century technology is turned off so that we don't disturb the mood of our early 20th century presentation. Tonight's lecturer is Professor Devin Nor. You've probably guessed that by now. Um, a, a member of the Department of History. He also holds the Marsha and J. Glazer Chair in Jewish Studies and Chair of the New Sephardic Studies Program at the University of Washington. He comes to us from Stanford University, where he earned his PhD, receiving along the way the best dissertation prize in his year. He's been a Fulbright Scholar to Greece, a fellow at the University of Washington Simpson Center for the Humanities, and he's a member of the Academic Advisory Council of the Center for Jewish History in New York. Those of you who have had the pleasure of witnessing any of the many presentations that Professor Nor has given around town will know that he's consistently thoughtful, polished, and engaging. Let's welcome him to the stage this evening. The Great War was supposed to be the war to end all wars, as my colleague Ray Jonas reminded us in the first lecture last week. While it did not secure perpetual peace, the Great War did establish territorial and ideological frameworks that shape much of our world today. The map of Europe and the Middle East was redrawn in the wake of the war. The multicultural, multilinguistic, multi-religious empires of the Habsburgs, Romanovs, and Ottomans came tumbling down. Out of the wreckage, a new Europe began to take shape. The autocratic rule of Kaisers, Tsars, and Sultans over a diverse array of people was supposed to be supplanted by a radically different kind of ideal political entity, the nation state, a term itself coined at the end of the war in 1918. 
the architects of the nation state aspired to create a state whose residents all formed part of a homogenous, single, national community, sharing one language, one culture, one history. The nation state was supposed to be governed according to the will of the people and the principle of national self-determination, a principle fervently supported by Woodrow Wilson as part of his famous 14 points in 1918. But could these ideals be transformed into reality? The concepts of self-determination, nationalism, the nation state, they remain entrenched in our political, social, and cultural vocabulary still today and saturate discussions of international affairs, media debates regarding Kosovo in recent years, Crimea, or Israel and Palestine. However, these concepts did not provide the innate organizing principles for vast segments of the world population prior to the Great War. Perhaps this was no truer than in the Balkan Peninsula, once referred to as Turkey in Europe, or locally as Rumeli, the provinces of the Ottoman Empire inhabited primarily by Christians. The Balkan Peninsula had been the object of Western gaze, was a mysterious hinterland in southeastern Europe at the crossroads between East and West, known as the powder keg at the shatter zones of the Ottoman and Habsburg empires that sparked the Great War. In the Balkans and in the Eastern Mediterranean more generally, where religious identifications had served as the cornerstone of society within the framework of the Ottoman Empire, the transition from empires to nation states was by no means a given. I'd like to explore this evening some of the contingencies and some of the unexpected pathways from the empire, from the Ottoman to the post-Ottoman world in the Balkans and in the adjacent regions. In order to do so, I'd like to weave together three long-term perspectives. First, the successive territorial losses suffered by the Ottoman Empire as a result of the ambitions of European powers. Second, the interrelated rise of nationalist movements among Ottoman populations, whose elite increasingly clamored for, and some of them actually gained, their own independent states. And third, the attempts by the Ottoman state to counter territorial losses and nationalist uprisings. These three aspects we might call European meddling, nationalist movements, and Ottoman responses intersected in fateful ways in the context of the Great War and produced cataclysmic effects. Mass murder of civilians, extensive population expulsions, and the end of the Ottoman Empire itself. From this perspective, the four years of the Great War must be understood as part of a broader series of wars in the region that spanned more than a decade. A war with Italy over Libya in 1910 and 1911, the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, the Great War itself, 1914 to 1918, and finally, the Greek-Turkish War of 1919 to 1922. These wars together, lasting more than a decade, constituted the final chapter in the life of the Ottoman Empire. Within this context, I'd also like to offer a glimpse into some of the alternatives available amidst this transition from empire to nation state, including the prospect of establishing a multinational state, not a single, single nation state, but a multinational state, as well as a little known proposal to transform one of the most important port cities in the, Balt in the Balkans into its own autonomous city state. These visions offer us vivid insight into different ways the future was once imagined and cut against our assumptions about the inevitable triumph of the nation state. Indeed, some even opted out 
of this transition from empire to nation state and decided to leave. Those who emigrated participated in one of the largest population movements in human history that brought millions across the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, many of whom arrived in the United States and some of whom traversed the continent and settled right here in Seattle. <clears throat> the Ottoman Empire was one of the largest and longest lived empires in the world. It endured for more than six centuries, from 1299 to 1923. And at its greatest territorial reach, it stretched from Budapest to Baghdad, from Belgrade to Baku, from Algiers to Jerusalem and Mecca and Medina. The Ottomans even laid siege to Vienna on two occasions. Now imagine if Freud, for example, had been born a subject of the Ottoman Sultan. While oftentimes considered part of radically different worlds, the Balkans, Hungary, and parts of Poland on the one hand, as well as the Middle East and North Africa on the other, all of these terrains were once united, in fact for generations, within the boundaries of a single empire, ruled from Constantinople, today's Istanbul. The territorial transition, actually the contraction of the Ottoman Empire, constitutes our first entry point into the discussion. Ever since Catherine the Great of Russia in the 18th century set her eyes on Constantinople to gain Russian access to the Mediterranean via the Bosphorus, the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire, if not the empire's existence itself, entered international diplomatic discussions. Napoleon confirmed the status of Constantinople as a coveted city when he supposedly remarked, if the earth were a single state, Constantinople would be its capital. Now, Napoleon led an expedition to Ottoman Egypt in 1798. His aim was to try to block British access to India. But this invasion marked a turning point, and it opened a new chapter in the history of the Ottoman Empire, one that would become increasingly marked by European intervention. Thus, France, Britain, and Russia each sought to resolve in their favor what became known as the Eastern Question. What will become of the territories of the Ottoman Empire, that sick man of Europe? In the ensuing power struggle, France and Britain often found themselves seeking to check Russia's expansionist ambitions, which we can see characterized here, whether during the Crimean War in the 1850s or the Russo-Ottoman War in the 1870s that concluded with the Treaty of Berlin in 1878. This treaty carved up Ottoman territory in the Balkans by creating an autonomous Bulgaria and independent Serbia and transferred Bosnia and Herzegovina to Austria-Hungary. Now, if we take a look at the territorial changes over the long durée, here we get a sense of the Ottoman Empire at its height in 1683, and we can see some of these transitions. By 1830, after Greek independence, 1878, after the Treaty of Berlin that I just mentioned, 1913, after the Balkan Wars, which we'll be speaking about in a moment, after World War I, which we will get to as well, and finally, the creation of the Republic of Turkey in 19. 23. What well, is not in Anatolia, the heartland of what became Turkey, where World War I began, but rather in parts of what had previously been part of the Ottoman Empire, namely the Balkans. Indeed, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who oversaw that Treaty of Berlin in 1878, supposedly quipped, quipped that one day the Great European War will come out of some damned foolish thing in the Balkans. Now, for Bismarck, the Balkans emerged as a likely setting for a major war, not necessarily because of ancient national animosities, often assumed to be endemic and part and parcel of that region, but rather due to the ill-fated maneuverings of the European powers bent on dictating the destiny of the southeastern corner of the continent. In effect, the European powers 
balkanized the Balkans. While these wars were waged largely in the name of nationalism, it's really important to recognize that until the 19th century, the vast majority of the residents of the Ottoman Empire did not think of themselves in national terms. Rather, the Ottoman state recognized only one category to differentiate and manage its subjects, religion. The Ottoman ruling dynasty combined the political authority of the Sultan with the religious authority of the Caliph, the leader of the Sunni Muslim community. Within this framework, the success and the durability of the empire derived from its flexibility and willingness to respect and accommodate local religions and customs, of course in exchange for taxes, sometimes exorbitant taxes, as well as pledges of loyalty. From the perspective of the Ottoman state, language, ethnic background, what we would later call race, were largely irrelevant. This was a world indeed of Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Terms that would later take on national significance referred primarily to what we might call social classes. Bulgarians, for example, was a term applied to peasants. Greeks, in contrast, referred to merchants. As far north as Poland, one observer remarked that all merchants in his area were called Greeks, even if they were Jews, Germans, or Serbs. So how then did these designations come to refer to distinct nations as we know them today? With the spread of the vocabulary of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, the concept of nationalism entered the Ottoman realm. Let's take a look at the Greek case because the Greeks were the first to successfully secede from the Ottoman Empire and establish their own, their own state in the name of their nation. Their exploits provided templates for later nationalist movements in the region and also illustrate some of the tensions, some of the paradoxes embedded in those processes. What's remarkable about the Greek case is that the first Greek-speaking intellectuals who came into contact with the rhetoric of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution did not, did not envision the creation of a specifically, exclusively Greek nation state as part of their goals. In 1797, Rigas Velistenlis, an Orthodox Christian then living abroad in Vienna, sought to adapt the terms of the French Constitution to accommodate the linguistic and religious diversity of the Ottoman realm. While the French Constitution proclaimed that the sovereign people embraces the whole of French citizens, the new political constitution of the inhabitants of Rumeli, meaning the Balkans, Asia Minor, the Mediterranean Islands, Moldova and Wallachia, what we would now call Romania, and in that document, Velistenlis declared something a little bit different. The sovereign people consists of all the inhabitants of the empire, without distinction of religion or speech, and he goes on to enumerate them. Greeks, Bulgarians, Albanians, Wallachians, Armenians, Turks, and every other kind of ethnos or nation. Other parts of this document, he refers to Jews as well. Velistenlis then envisioned a multinational state. He agreed that these different groups did indeed constitute their own nations, but did not foresee them creating their own states. His plan did not materialize, and in fact, he was assassinated the year after he proposed this project. Instead, when Greeks launched the first successful revolution to overthrow the Ottomans, whom they now reconstrued as their occupiers, their overlords, their slave masters, they took up arms in the 1820s with the encouragement of Russia in the name of faith and fatherland. As this slogan demonstrates, religion and land, not language, say, constituted the key elements of Greek national identity. The first constitution of independent Greece in 1822 made this link explicit between nation and religion in declaring that those indigenous inhabitants of the state of Greece who believe in Christ are Greeks. Rather than supplant religion, nationalism became conjoined to it and defined now in both geographical and political terms. 
paradoxes ensued. The Ottoman Sultan, for example, held the Orthodox Christian Church, the Patriarchate in Constantinople, responsible for the rebellion among its flock and executed the Patriarch as punishment. And this is kind of ironic because the Patriarchate had opposed Greek independence and the very concept of nationalism on the grounds that it constituted a heresy that threatened to, to divide the Orthodox Christian population, the community of the faithful, and undermined the church's ecumenical purview. And this is precisely what happened. The establishment of an independent Greek church paved the way for the creation of a Bulgarian and then Serbian church as part of the process of establishing national sovereignty. Serbian and Bulgarian revolutionaries thus aimed to liberate their newly minted nations from the yoke of the Turks in the realm of politics and from the Greeks in the realm of religion. As the first successful war waged in the name of national secession from the Ottoman Empire, the Greek Revolution did not, however, result in what we might consider complete independence. Rather, it remained contingent upon the will of the European powers. Britain, France, and Russia agreed to appoint a Bavarian king as the monarch of the new state of Greece without asking the Greeks themselves what they thought about it. Greek ideologues also sought to reconcile their emphasis on Orthodox Christianity with claims promoted by Philhellenes in the West, most famously Lord Byron, who gazed upon the Greeks through a romantic lens as heirs of the founders of democracy and the cradle of Western civilization. Could a cogent national narrative weave together the ancient ideals of democracy with Orthodox Christianity and the Greek language? Could Athens, then a village of a few thousand residents with a skyline accented by minarets, and selected by this new Bavarian king as the capital, without asking the Greeks what they thought about it, could Athens be returned to its ancient glory as imagined and dreamed about in the West? Finally, could the borders of the newly independent state of Greece be expanded to include all of the Greek people, all of the members of this ostensible Greek nation? Notably, the majority of the potential citizens of Greece actually chose to remain in the Ottoman realm, and many who lived in independent Greece actually, for economic reasons, decided to go to the Ottoman Empire. Faced with the dilemma of more Greeks living beyond the state's borders than within them, nationalists developed what became known as the Megali Idea, the great idea, which guided Greek foreign policy into the 20th century and envisioned the expansion of the boundaries of the Greek state to encompass and thus redeem all of the potential members of the Greek nation. The prime minister of Greece in 1844 articulated this vision for the first time. The Greek kingdom is not the whole of Greece, but only a part, the smallest and poorest part. A Greek is not just someone who lives within this kingdom, but also one who lives in Ioannina, in Salonika, in Adrianople, in Constantinople, in Crete. He listed many others. I cut them out for the sake of... Uh... And in any land associated with Greek history and the Greek race. There are two cores of Hellenism, Athens, the capital of the Greek kingdom, and the city, Constantinople, the dream and the hope of the Greeks. This vision for a greater Greece, like the ideals of greater Serbia and greater Bulgaria after, did not seek to create a circumscribed nation state, but rather imagine the recreation of empire. In this case, the Greece of two continents and five seas, with Constantinople, the home of the Patriarchate and once the capital of Byzantium, and at that time the capital of the Ottoman Empire, as its new center. All the military expeditions that Greece embarked upon, including World War I, had as their goal the realization of the Megali Idea and the redemption of the Orthodox Christian populations beyond the borders of newly independent Greece. Now, this is where things get pretty interesting because residents 
of the regions targeted by the great idea remained unconvinced of this new national ideal. Especially in rural areas, they adamantly clung to their religious affiliations. At the turn of the century, for example, a Greek nationalist active near Salonika inquired among the locals whether they were Greeks or Bulgarians. He recalled, they stared at me uncomprehendingly, asking each other what my word me words meant, crossing themselves. They would answer me naively, naively, well, we're Christians. What do you mean Greeks or Bulgarians? National identities were thus not set but they had to be learned, they had to be forged, coerced, chosen. They remained contingent, malleable, re and they reconfigured the relationships between religion, language, and location. When Ottoman census clerks were dispatched to the Balkan provinces in 1905, a Bulgarian nationalist sent a missive to the leaders of a village. I greet you all. The census clerks who will be coming to your village will give you new identification cards and ask you which denomination you belong to. Tell them, we are not Rum, we are not Greek Orthodox Christians, we are Bulgars, Bulgarian Orthodox Christians, and that you are of Bulgar denomination because you speak Bulgarian. Villagers, look, open up your beautiful eyes. And now here comes the threat. Don't have yourselves registered as Rum, because then no good will come to your children, your goods, and your animals. Until today, we somehow forgave your mistakes, but realized that you could lose your well-being. So we see it was through threats and sometimes through opportunism, we might say, that denomination could be transformed, transformed into nation. Greek and Bulgarian ideologues thus battled over the souls and allegiances of Orthodox Christian masses. And as a British traveler observed, villages will shift their allegiance from the Greek to the Bulgarian church twice or thrice in a year. One must watch how the wind blows, to quote their saying. In the hope of quelling the various nationalist movements, launched during the 19th century, and to halt the intervention into the internal affairs of the state by foreign powers, the Ottoman Empire instituted a series of centralizing reforms known as the Tanzimat. The Ottoman state sought to centralize the administration of the empire's far-flung provinces, to introduce military reforms so they could compete with their neighbors, the aggressors, and to transform its diverse subjects into Ottoman citizens. The Ottoman reforms sought to guarantee all Ottoman citizens equal rights regardless of their religion. The Ottoman state helped to garner political loyalty while also providing each community with the continued privilege to develop its own distinctive culture and religious traditions. And here we see, for example, a very interesting example of that where we have a Jewish wedding contract from the turn of the century in the Ottoman Empire, and it has the traditional Hebrew script and the traditional uh, Jewish formulas for a wedding and a marriage. But you could see at the very top here, in the circle, we have the symbols of the Ottoman Empire, the symbols of Islam, the green crescent and the red star. So here we can see a great example of the weaving together of both Jewish and Ottoman themes and symbology in the making of what we have here is an Ottoman Jewish document. This was part of a project on the part of the Ottoman state to create a unifying political ideology known as Ottomanism that sought to bind the various residents of the empire to each other and to the state. As, the, as a promoter of the new ideology explained in the wake of the proclamation of the renewed Ottoman constitution in 1908, the Ottoman nation is a collective that evolved from the coming together in one place of different peoples, like the Turks, Arabs, Albanians, Kurds, Armenians, Greeks, Bulgarians, and Jews, who all possess different religions and ethnicities. Only the shared Ottoman homeland according to this formulation of what we might call civic rather than 
ethnic nationalism could promote and safeguard the interests and aspirations of each of these communities that constituted this new, evolved Ottoman nation. This was, in a certain sense, an Ottoman spring. The experiment with Ottomanism infused the final sense of optimism into the possibility of different populations in the region living together as citizens of a common homeland. Representatives of each community thus met the promulgation of the Constitution with cheers. Yasha sin milet, long live the nation, in Turkish. Zito zito al sultanos, long live the sultan, in Greek. Viva la patria, long live the homeland, in Ladino, the Judeo-Spanish language spoken by Ottoman Jews. The Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 provided a fleeting opportunity for all Ottoman citizenry to come together and come to the aid of their homeland, both on the home front, if not the battlefront. But humiliating defeat soon brought the aura of optimism to a close. The subsequent decade of incessant war in the region, which followed initial battles with Italy and North Africa whittled away at the inclusive definition of the Ottoman citizen and inaugurated the final chapter in the demise of the Ottoman Empire. The First Balkan War in 1912 pitted the nation states, the nas nascent states, which were also nation states, of Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Montenegro against the Ottoman Empire. This war was a kind of declaration of independence, not only from Ottoman rule, but also from the European powers. Through the war, the Balkan states proposed to resolve the so-called Eastern question on their own terms by wresting away the remaining Ottoman territories in the Balkans without the guidance or the permission of the European powers. They succeeded, but could not agree on how to divvy up the spoils. That was the Second Balkan War in 1913, which pitted Greece, Bulgaria, and Serbia against each other as they claimed the same territories and their residents as their own. The Balkan Wars resulted in the near-complete expulsion of the Ottoman Empire from the Balkan Peninsula, which had served as a core part of the empire for centuries, and until the 19th century, about half of the residents of all of the Ottoman Empire actually resided in the Balkans, in the European provinces of the Ottoman Empire. These territorial losses and the relegation of the Ottoman, Ottomans out of Europe to the remaining territories in Asia planted the seeds for revenge that would motivate the Ottoman entry into the Great War. The Speaker of the Ottoman Chamber of Deputies proclaimed in 1914, I now have one plea to my people, not to forget. Don't forget the cradle of our freedom and our constitution, our beloved Salonika and the entire beautiful Rumeli. I ask all of our leaders to keep alive in this generation and in future generations the memories of the limbs of our homeland on the other side of our borders that must be liberated. The spark that set off the European-wide conflict transpired the following month after that declaration. This was June 1914 when a Serbian nationalist born in Ottoman Bosnia assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, took place in Sarajevo. Founded as an Ottoman city in 1461, Sarajevo, a fundamentally multi-religious and multicultural city, an Ottoman city, had been incorporated into Austro-Hungary in 1878 and formally annexed in 1908. From the rule of one empire, the Ottomans, the residents of the city had become subject to the rule of yet another, the Habsburgs. Serbia hoped to rectify what was perceived to be a, a historic injustice by expanding its borders to encompass Sarajevo as well as all of Bosnia to liberate the land from Habsburg rule and to unite all of the southern Slavs, as they became known, the Yugoslavs, into one state. The assassination transpired, not coincidentally, on the 525th anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo, a bloody conflict in 1389 that resulted in the Serbian principalities paying tribute to the Ottoman Sultan. 
It became an event to which Serbian nationalists appealed, only beginning in the 19th century, as a way to inspire their movement for national reawakening, as it was termed, constructing a narrative according to which during the centuries of the Ottoman rule, the nation had existed as such, but had merely been subjugated and sleeping. The catastrophic intersection of great power ambition and nationalist asp aspirations plunged the continent into war. Austria-Hungary gave Serbia an ultimatum and alliances were established accordingly. Russia mobilized in support of the Orthodox Christian Slavs of Serbia, joined by France and Britain against Austria-Hungary and Germany. The Ottoman Empire initially stayed out. The Entente actually tried to court the Ottomans with the promise that its territorial integrity would be preserved if they did not enter the war. The Ottoman leadership was quite skeptical of this promise, and they refused. Instead, the Ottoman state saw in the Great War an opportunity to reclaim its dignity, which had been severely violated amidst the Balkan Wars, and to ensure its security and independence from European intervention. The Ottomans thus attacked Russia across the Black Sea in October of 1914, entering the war on the side of the Germans. Germany and the Ottoman Empire shared a common enemy, and that was Russia. Plus, Germany was the only major European power that did not have ambitions or claims in Ottoman territories. The Ottoman leadership thus declared holy war against the Entente, while also appealing simultaneously to modern and pseudoscientific rhetoric regarding a Darwinian struggle for the survival of the fittest. Only in retrospect may the Ottoman entry into the war appear as a death wish. Despite its major victory at the Battle of Gallipoli, in which British and French efforts to capture Constantinople were repelled, the Ottoman Empire, like Austria-Hungary, was in its final throes. It was in the context of war that a million Ottoman citizens would be killed at the initiative of their own government. Like the Christian populations in the Balkans before them, the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire had clamored for expanded rights of self-government since the 19th century era of Ottoman reform. And as with Greeks, Serbs, and Bulgarians, Armenians received assistance and an encouragement from, guess, Russia. Their fate, the so-called Armenian question, became tied to the broader Eastern question and the destiny of the Ottoman Empire as a whole. Already in the 1890s, the Ottoman state began to offer its own answer to the Armenian question by massacring 200,000 Armenians in an effort to put them in their place and remind them that national aspirations would not be tolerated. Even so, like all communities in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians also celebrated the 1908 Constitution, which they hoped would usher in the desired liberty, equality, and justice. But in the context of the Great War a few years later, the Ottoman state feared that renewed collusion between Armenians and Russia would lead to Armenian autonomy and the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire, that Armenia would become a Bulgaria in the East, pulled away from right out of Ottoman control. When some Armenians took up arms in support of Russia during the war, the Ottoman leadership acted swiftly to punish all Armenians, even though most neither had weapons nor intended to participate in armed conflict. The mixture of resentment, nationalism, foreign meddling, and the cover of war proved lethal. First, Armenian soldiers were disarmed and deported. Then, on April 24, 1915, the Young Turk regime arrested more than 200 leading Armenians in Constantinople and soon executed them. 
In the following months, general deportations of Armenians, including women and children, to the deserts of Mesopotamia commenced by train and by foot. Many were tortured, shot, or hacked to death. Women joined harems to save their lives. Others died of starvation and disease. The Tigris ran with the blood of Armenians. Others escaped by paying bribes, fleeing to Russia, or converting to Islam. Now, by virtue of being able to convert and escape being murdered, it demonstrates that, again, this concept of race was not at the heart of the matter per se. But Henry Morgenthau, then the ambassador for the United States in Constantinople, recognized that the young Turks had issued the Armenians nothing short of a death warrant. Neither the United States nor any European power intervened, and actually the German ambassador sought to prevent it in some instances. In all, one of every two Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, a million Armenians, perished. Now, was a horrific massacre of the Armenians amidst the Great War a final effort by the Ottoman leadership to save their sinking empire and rid themselves of a perceived enemy within, bent on bringing down the empire? Or did the massacre become a first act in the consolidation of the new Turkish nation-state, of a Turkey for the Turks? Either way, it was the suffering of the Armenians that the Polish Jewish lawyer Raphael Lemkin had in mind three decades later when he coined the term genocide. In the context of the Great War, the end of empires appeared on the horizon and the triumph of the nation-state loomed large. But the residents of Salonika, a key port city in the Balkans in what's now northern Greece, asserted their collective aspirations and proposed an alternative to this transition. An ancient city on the Aegean Sea that had served as the site of the proclamation of the constitution of the Ottoman Empire in 1908, Salonika was further distinguished by its unique demographic composition. Approximately half of the 170,000 residents of the city were Sephardic Jews, whose ancestors had arrived in the city following their expulsion from Spain in 1492. Until the 20th century, they spoke Ladino, a Judeo-Spanish language written in Hebrew letters. The preponderance and prosperity of the city's Jews even resulted in the port closing every Saturday in observance of the Jewish Sabbath. That was if you were Jewish, Muslim, or Christian. Saturday was your day off. Yet as the most important commercial entry point for the Balkans, the gate to the Mediterranean, and home to an Orthodox Christian population as well, the city was coveted by both Bulgaria and Greece which waged the Balkan Wars primarily to wrest Salonika and the surrounding region of Macedonia away from the Ottomans and then from each other. The city served as a potent symbol for competing national claims. As the birthplace of Saint Cyril and Methodius, who brought Christianity and the Cyrillic alphabet to the Slavs, Salonika, known as Solun in the Slavic languages, served as a beacon for Bulgarians. Named in honor of the half-sister of Alexander the Great of Macedonia, home of the patron saint Demetrius, and once the second city of the Byzantine Empire, Salonika, known in Greek as Thessaloniki, held great significance for Greeks too. In, res in response to the prospect of the incorporation of Salonika into either Greece or Bulgaria, a prominent Jewish journalist, David Florentine, purporting to speak on behalf of the city's Jews, offered an alternative and made an extraordinary claim in 1912. 
Salonika is neither Greek, nor Bulgarian, nor Turkish. She's Jewish. Accordingly, Salonika, uh, Florentine proposed that Salonika be transformed into an international city, like Tangiers in Morocco or Dalian in Manchuria, guaranteed by the European powers, but governed by a Jewish administration, a kind of autonomous Jewish city-state. Such an arrangement, Florentine argued, would be the only just fate for this queen of Jewishness in the East. The annexation of the city to either Greece or Bulgaria would precipitate economic ruin, for it would cut off the port from the vast hinterland on which the city's commerce depended. Florentine concluded, Salonika would become a heart that would cease to beat, a head that would be severed from a dismembered body. Now, perhaps most remarkable was the preference for Jewish rule or internationalization that was also voiced by non-Jews in the city. A special committee comprised of local Muslims, Vlachs, which kind of like Romanians, you could say, Jews, and Dunme, who are descendants of Jewish converts to Islam, together advocated that the widely endorsed principle of nationalities be applied to Salonika like everywhere else, and that since Jews constituted the predominant national group in the city, Jews ought to reign sovereign. Jewish, Muslim, Orthodox, Christian, and Donme merchants propose that at the very least, Salonika ought to be transformed into a free city to enable a smooth transition out of Ottoman rule. As no state spoke for the Jews in the region, and the possibility of a Jewish state was by no means guaranteed anywhere, general Jewish interests dovetailed with those of the city's merchant classes. Still in 1919, a Salonican Jewish spokesman made a final plea at the Paris Peace Conference. Appealing once again to that principle of nationalities, he argued that only if Salonika garnered international recognition and the right to be administered by the local Jews would Salonika enter the great family of the League of Nations, assure tranquility in the Balkans, and ultimately guarantee European peace. The conceptualization of Salonika as a kind of city-state all unto itself, on par with other European nation-states, constituted the boldest claim about the city's possible status. And why not? More Jews lived in Salonika than, say, Jerusalem or all of Palestine. Even the New York Times had commented that Salonican Jewish autonomy would be just as likely, just as necessary, as in Palestine, as this headline makes clear. Suggestion for Jewish autonomy in Salonika and Palestine under guarantee of the nations as a solution for the problems arising from Balkan-Turkish war and complications in Asia Minor. But it was not to be. One wonders what direction Balkan and European geopolitics might have taken if the bold visions for a Jewish city-state in Salonika or the plan for internationalization had come to pass. While presenting intriguing counterfactual scenarios, these plans remind us that the collapse of empire and the triumph of nation-states was not inevitable. Other dreams of the future and ideas and ideals for political and social organization were debated and discussed, even if they weren't realized. The city-state emerged as a prospect, one with roots in ancient Greece, the republics of Italy, the Renaissance era, but which did not win out ultimately in modern Europe. Ironically, however, it had been a series of wars that were waged, ostensibly in the name of self-determination, but it was not the people who would necessarily determine their own fate, but rather governments and European powers speaking for them and allegedly in their best interests. The occupation of Salonika by the Greek army was quickly reconstrued as its liberation. Yet shortly thereafter, in 1913, the Greek king was assassinated in broad daylight in that very city by a revolutionary in an episode that foreshadowed the much more notorious assassination of Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo the following year. Now, once the Great War began, Greece initially opted for neutrality, but a national schism soon divided the country. A charismatic Republican leader, Eleftherios Venizelos, 
established an oppositional government in Salonika and invited Entente troops to the city from which they could battle the Ottomans and the Bulgarians on the Macedonian front. The maneuver turned out to be a turning point in the war in the favor of the Entente forces. Yet the situation in Salonika was aggravated by the presence of several hundred thousand troops stationed in the city and by a massive fire that erupted in 1917 that reduced two-thirds of the city to ashes and left 70,000 residents of the city homeless. They were primarily Jews. Emboldened by the eventual Entente victory and seeing the capture of Salonika as bringing Greece one step closer to the capture of Constantinople and the fulfillment of the Megali Idea, the great idea, Greek troops under the leadership of Venizelos invaded Asia Minor at the conclusion of the Great War to start yet another war. Ultimately repulsed by Turkish troops under the command of Salonikan-born Mustafa Kemal Pasha, who later took the name Ataturk, the irredentist aspirations of Greece came to a conclusion. The final conflict reduced the great Aegean port city of Smyrna, Izmir, to ashes, and it's remembered the whole event by the Greeks as a great catastrophe and by the Turks as a Turkish war of independence. At the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, convened under the auspices of the League of Nations, Greece and Turkey consented to what was called an exchange of populations under the pretext of harmonizing the boundaries of the state with those of the nation, not through the expansion of state borders, but rather through the swapping of peoples. In effect, this decision amounted to mutual agreed upon and internationally enforced expulsions. A half million Muslims were expelled from Greece and sent to Turkey, and 1.5 million Orthodox Christians were expelled from Turkey and sent to Greece. They were exiled to a country that the nationalist elites and the European powers decided ought to be their homeland. Remarkably, in this ultimate act of national consolidation of demographic engineering, language actually remained irrelevant, and only religion mattered. Although endorsing the category of religion as a litmus test for national belonging in the context of this exchange of populations, Turkey ultimately emerged as a new republic, abolished the sultanate and the caliphate, and introduced other secularizing reforms as it sought entrance into the family of European states. For Greece, which proclaimed its own republic in 1924, the influx of Orthodox Christian refugees significantly increased the country's population as they arrived in a foreign land that they were now supposed to embrace as their own. With a large percentage of the new arrivals directed to settle in Salonika, the demographic balance of the city finally shifted in favor of the Orthodox Christians, who, for the first time, outnumbered Jews. It was in the midst of the ensuing tensions, after more than a decade of war, that my own grandfather and his family opted to leave Salonika, a city where they and their ancestors had resided for more than four centuries, but where they had now become an embattled minority. And they left in the hope of trying their luck in a new land, America. Indeed, <clears throat> emigration emerged as an alternative for residents of the war-torn region. Exit represented a decision to opt out of the transition from empire to nation-state and to seek a new beginning in a new land. 
around 450,000 Greeks, 70,000 Armenians, and 50,000 Sephardic Jews came to the United States from the end of the 19th century through the Great War. They came in search of economic opportunities, to evade military conscriptions, to escape the region's wars and nationalist conflicts, most settled in New York. Still others traversed the continent, with some ultimately making Washington State their new home. As the Balkan Wars raged, for example, Mark Balaban, an Armenian from Smyrna, began his voyage by ship by England to America, and then by rail to the Pacific Northwest. The year was 1913. He arrived in Seattle where he met a fellow Armenian named Armin Tertsagian. They tried a few ventures together, an Armenian restaurant, a yogurt factory. Yogurt, people didn't know about yogurt here yet. Actually, it wasn't until a Salonican Jew who left during the Great War and came first to Spain, then France to the United States, and established a company called Dannon, that yogurt entered our market here in America. <laughs> but Tertsagian and Balaban soon headed to eastern Washington, where they encountered the lush fruit orchards of the Kashmir Valley and began cultivating apples. They named their apple farm Liberty Orchards in honor of the newfound freedoms they encountered in America in contrast to the devastating persecution experienced by their fellow Armenians back in the Ottoman Empire amidst the Great War. Seeking to help out the American war effort, Liberty Orchards began dehydrating their surplus fruit to ship to the U.S. troops overseas so that the boys in action could still have their apple a day. Soon, Tertsagian and Balaban came up with another idea Ah, so you know about this. <laughs> Came up with another idea for their surplus fruit, to make a treat familiar to them from their youth, lakum, also known as Turkish delights, and thus the popular Pacific Northwest confection known as applets and cutlets was born. In addition to Armenians, Greeks began to establish their own institutions in Seattle during World War I, a sign that they would not be returning to the land of their birth. For example, Alexander Pantages from the island of Andros became a successful businessman whose Pantages Theaters, the biggest established in 1915 amidst the Great War, brought vaudeville theater to the Puget Sound, to Seattle, to Tacoma. Seattle's broader Greek population numbered approximately 2,000 by this time, 1916, still amidst the Great War, and they decided to establish their own Greek Orthodox Church. One of the members of the community donated an icon of St. Demetrius to the new church, which thus took its name from the patron saint of none other than the city of Salonika. By the time the Great War had concluded, in 1919, the cornerstone was laid for Seattle's St. Demetrius Church, which opened in 1921, and which subsequently was relocated to its present location in Montlake. Just as Armenians and Greeks had come to the Pacific Northwest from Ottoman locales, and former Ottoman locales, so too did the first Sephardic Jews arrive from the realm of the Sultan. By World War I, their numbers had increased until several hundred Sephardic families, with names like Calvo, al Khadef, and Polakar. Here we see Levi. These families now came to call Seattle their home too. Some made their living as the first, first fish vendors at Pike Place Market during the Great War. When a half dozen of Seattle's Sephardic Jews served in the United States Army during the war, they did so with excitement to support their new homeland, but with trepidation knowing that they were fighting against their former homeland, where relatives and friends remained and whom they feared they may encounter in the trenches. For Sephardic Jews, like the Greeks, the start of the Great War also signified that their residence in Seattle would become permanent. To root themselves in their new city, they founded their own synagogues, the Sephardic Bihor Cholim in 1914 and Congregation Ezra Besarot in 1917, both in the Central District, and both of those organizations continue to operate today in Seward Park. 
After the war, like Armenians and Greeks, Sephardic Jews realized that the former Ottoman lands where their families had resided for generations no longer appeared as hospitable as before. As one spokesman lamented after the United States shut its doors to mass immigration in 1924, the war hardened the hearts of everyone and national chauvinism is rampant in all of Europe. But it had been precisely in the name of the principle of nationalism, of self-determination, that states were born and wars were waged. Ultimately, the Balkans and Asia Minor experienced what has often been termed the unmixing of peoples. But this phrase conceals as much as it reveals, for mixity remained. Definitions of national belonging were still in flux and contested and processes of remixing persisted. It was not clear if complete disentangling could in fact be achieved or if it was even desirable. The reconstruction of largely religious identities into national ones nonetheless provided an ideological tool through which the elites of new, new states, in fact new elites of those new states, those aspiring nation states sought to legitimize their authority, consolidate their power in the Balkans and in Turkey, and in the process, unmix or otherwise remove those populations not deemed to fit. As our exploration this evening has demonstrated, the triumph of nationalism was not preordained. Religious identities remained firmly rooted in the region and were not so much supplanted by national identities as fused to them in the context of European intervention and Ottoman reform. These elements collided amidst the Great War, experienced in the region as part of more than a decade of bloodshed from the Balkan Wars to the Greek-Turkish War that constituted the last chapter in the life of the Ottoman Empire. The results were devastating and involved mass massacres and population expulsions, what we, what we would call today genocide and ethnic cleansing. But we must remember that alternatives to the violent path from multicultural empire to homogenous nation state emerged along the way. Whether Greek, Greek Enlightenment thinker Rigas Velistenlis' multinational constitution of 1797 the inclusive vision of Ottomanism initially developed in the later 19th century, or the plan to transform Saronica into an independent city-state, all of which sprung from what appeared to be realistic possibilities at the time, even if they remained unrealized. The exponential rise of immigration further indicated that some chose to opt out amidst the perilous transition from empire to nation state. Ultimately, the principle of self-determination was applied haphazardly after World War I. Despite the alleged goals of the newly established international governing body, the League of Nations, the European powers, or the United States, agreed to implement the principle only when it appeared to be in their interests. It was actually the League of Nations that endorsed new colonial regimes, or mandates as they were called, for Britain and France to replace Ottoman rule in the Middle East. On the grounds that the residents of the region were not ready, not sufficiently civilized to govern themselves, not quite prepared for self-determination. We see the seeds of future conflicts. If you take a look at some of the places listed there, 1920, they're in the news right now. Turkey, Persia, meaning Iran, Mesopotamia, Iraq, Syria, which the Chicago Tribune cartoonist presently observed in 1920. It was the year before in 1919 where Woodrow Wilson had already second-guessed the principle of national self-determination he had previously touted because he knew it would likely remain unfulfilled for many. He wrote, You do not know and cannot appreciate 
the anxieties that I have experienced as a result of many millions of people having their hopes raised by what I said regarding the prospect of national self-determination. National self-determination promised that the powerless would become powerful, that those without a say would get a say, that those subjugated would gain their freedom. And this was a promise that those in power made, but one some wished would not or believed could not come to fruition. We live in a world shaped by the Great War, not only because many of the lines on our map were drawn a century ago with the collapse of Europe's great land empires, but also because the dreams and aspirations unlocked amidst the conflict, some fulfilled, others unrequited, continue to animate our international political system today. Thank you. If you take in a moment to jot your questions down, they'll be collected and brought forward. We'll give Professor Nahr just a minute to catch his breath. And then I'm going to ask a question that, that, uh, that I'd like to ask, and then we'll, we'll get to the audience questions as they arrive. So, um, so Professor Nara, you, you talked about Greek, Bulgarian, Armenian, Turkish national aspirations uh, in the context of World War I. But aside from the Jews of Salonika, you didn't talk about Jewish nationalism. And of course, we know that in the context of the First World War, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, uh, in connection with Zionism, um, you know, what, what, were the, the, um, what was the status of Jewish nationalism in this context? Great. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, it's a really interesting one if we take a look at Jewish national aspirations and, and the term Zionism from the perspective of Jews in the Ottoman Empire. Okay. because. Uh, the story was a little bit different for Jews in that context because Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire from 1517 until the end of World War I, basically. And so in the context of Ottoman Jewish experiences throughout the late 19th and early 20th century when Zionism was coming on the scene, when Jewish nationalism was coming on the scene, Ottoman Jews had a very different take on what Jewish nationalism was supposed to be about. As we saw, a lot of the, uh, some of the Jews were very much invested in this project of Ottomanism, of this sort of idea of a multinational state, that you could be Jewish, Armenian, Greek, Bulgarian, Turkish, and we could all be part of sort of this Ottoman polity. So in that context, they supported Ottomanism insofar as they saw it as part of uh, they supported Zionism insofar as they saw it as part of an Ottomanist project. What do I mean by that? So Jews would support Jewish, Ottoman Jews would support Jewish immigration to the Ottoman Empire, to Palestine, for example, but they would request that the Jews coming would become Ottoman citizens and would join in this project of Ottoman Jewish nationalism. They like to think that the Ottoman Empire would open up its doors to those Jews who were suffering from pogroms in, in Romania or Russia in the late 19th and early 20th century, let them into the Ottoman realm, just as the Sephardic Jews themselves, their ancestors, had been invited to settle in the Ottoman Empire after 1492. And on the more explicit political level, the leaders of Ottoman Jewry until World War I, actually, because they were invested in this project of Ottomanism, and because they also realized there was a fear involved here, they realized what would happen if they tried to rise up and, and seek to overthrow the Ottoman regime. They saw their, what happened to their Armenian neighbors. They were explicitly opposed to the Zionist project until World War I. And after the Balfour Declaration, and after uh, Palestine is no longer under Ottoman control, things change, and Zionist movements in the former Ottoman realm develop much along the lines of those in other European 
population. Um, here's a very interesting comparative question. It uh, points out the Ottoman Empire's acceptance of diverse religions, ethnicities, races. How was this acceptance mirrored in the US? What can you say about the comparative aspects of diversity in the Ottoman Empire versus in the US for the same period? Yeah, it's a really great question because there seem to be maybe some similarities on the surface, but these are very different kinds of universes. Um, you know, you come to the United States and, uh, or you're born in the United States, and whether you identify with a particular religious group or a community is completely voluntary. Um, so if you want to belong to a church, you can belong to a church. You want to belong to a synagogue or a mosque, you can do that. You want to participate in some of these communal events, you can do it if you want. If you don't want to, not a problem. But in the case of the Ottoman Empire, um, you were part of a community. Um, and this was not really by choice. Uh, you were registered as part of the community for life cycle events. You know, the only way you could get married, there was no civil marriage, for example. The only way you could get married is if you had permission from your religious authorities. You couldn't intermarry, for example, unless uh, you converted to the other person's religion. And so, in that regard, the, what the, the Ottoman Empire was really premised on recognizing difference. Right? So even in the late period of the 19th century where you have this Ottomanist ideal coming about where you could be Armenian and Ottoman, you could be Jewish and Ottoman, it was both. Mm -hmm. you know? So it wasn't like, you know, here in America you can be whatever you want. But in, in, in the context of the Ottoman Empire, there was sort of like this dual affiliation that was enforced by the local elite as well as by the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, like, diversity could flourish within certain accepted uh, terms. Okay. Here's one that's related um, that I think is really interesting. Uh, in hindsight, um, should we regret the passing of the empires? Uh, well, you know, I think sometimes discussions of empires these days can provoke a sense of nostalgia. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, this is a trope that you can see in certain circles, both on the left Right. and on the right, right. Um, who would like to see the Ottoman Empire come back uh, to life or you know, the, the Habsburg Empire, you know, whatever empire you want. Um, I don't think that we should be mourning the passage of that, those empires or, or expect or anticipate for them to be reconstituted, but I do think maybe there are some clues in those experiences that we might look at again right. and think about ways in which we might apply them to our contemporary existence. Um, and that's exactly the next question. So you refer to the city-state as a possible model, right? Um, as one that, that was proposed at least for Salonika. Um, were there other experiments with the city-state model or was this a unique? Yeah, yeah there idea? were some other experiments. Um, you know, there, there was, uh, Tangiers was sort of like an independent free city for a certain time. Um, Danzig, Gdansk, was an independent free city until from world, end of World War I until 1939. Uh, but, you know, in Europe, the city-state in modern times didn't really, you know, work out too well. But where you do see sort of maybe city-states coming back a little bit is part of sort of the residue of other colonial regimes. Like if you take a look at former British colonial enterprises in the Far East, for example, you have some sites that were set up really as commercial entrepôts, commercial sites, like in the 19th century. Um, you know, you could take like Singapore or, or Hong Kong uh, would be good examples that are not exactly like city-states, ex but they have some, they sort of operate as cities. Dubai maybe also works kind of like this. And what's interesting about these places is that they are coming exactly out of this colonial encounter. Their populations are primarily from elsewhere. They're primarily interested in commerce and business. And that is the modus vivendi. That's what makes them tick. Uh, and that was sort of the argument that was made for Salonika as well. Like the, the Jewish interests dovetailed with, with what were really merchant interests. You know, Salonika will be the most successful 
economic site it can be if it becomes an international city or if it becomes autonomous. And it's that, those same kind of, I don't know, you can call them maybe mer mercantilist kind of expectations or aspirations, you know, promoting commerce for the sake of the development of the place and for commerce itself. That well, it'll be interesting to see what happens in those, those places in, in the Far East in, in coming years. Okay, so here's a question that goes in the other direction. Could it have been possible, so instead of the city-state, the sort of this, the polis, could it have been possible to have a multi-ethnic, multilingual nation-state as a successor to the, um, to, to the empires? And, and what, what form might that have taken? Well, so, so here's another. You have some maybe examples that are kind of like this. If you take Albania, for example, Albania has Christians and Muslims sharing a language. And so that constituted a nation state, but along a different kind of model in which language became the dominant kind of trope. You take a look at um, the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, which became right. Yugoslavia. This was kind of a multinational state to a certain extent, but it was also a multinational state that had a lot of people who didn't belong to that predominant Slavic, predominantly Christian background, and you know, Muslim minorities, Catholic versus Orthodox issues uh, that would, you know, that resurged in, 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 re in very recent memory. And so uh, I think, you know, having, I, the question is, you know, what, what constitutes the nation? If you're going to make a state, what's going to constitute the nation? If you're going to make an argument about the nation having like a shared sense of religion or language or uh, history or culture or, or, or blood or race, uh, then it, it doesn't leave a lot of space for people who are not part of that in-group to be fully enfranchised citizens in the way that others are. So I think you know, maybe there are possibilities for multinational states, but I don't know about multinational singular nation states. Okay. Um, here's a question on the, on, on the issue of the Armenian genocide. So, so what is the status of the Armenian genocide within modern Turkey? Uh, no status. I, I modified the question a little. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, you know, no, 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 no status. Right. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the Turkish official line would be that these were acts that were perpetrated in the context of war, yeah. that um, these were not civilians that were being attacked, or not only civilians, but these were people who were armed. And so but you have to bend over. You have to do a lot of somersaults to make that argument you know, <coughs> convincing. Uh, I mean, I, I, it, I it's not. Um, but I think you know, it remains one of these very contested issues. And, and, and still, you know, there are many other things that are changing in Turkish politics um, today. But the Armenian genocide uh, and the lack of its recognition has been one of those issues, along with many others, that has sort of kept Turkey outside of that European family that in some ways uh, some of its leaders, the secular leaders, at least since Ataturk, have been trying to enter for, you know, 90 years. Here's a question that gets to your aftermaths, the yeah. part of your talk. Until recently, Seattle had the second largest Sephardic community in North America, um, behind New York City, I guess LA now is the second largest. What, what's behind that? Why, why is it that Seattle would be the, the home to such a large Sephardic community? Don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's one, of those, uh, one of those peculiarities of history. I mean, you know, I mean there, there's not like a really good reason for Seattle to have been, been home to such a large mm -hmm. Sephardic community. I mean, um, it just seems that the story of chain migration that we hear from many, many migrant communities was very successful in the case of the Sephardic Jews who came to Seattle. Um, you know, you had a few families that came from really two or three locales, and they brought over relatives over the course of a few, uh, a few decades. Like in the case of Rhodes, pretty much, but by the, t by the onset of World War II, like almost half of the Jews of Rhodes were living in Seattle. Um, and so, you know, Seattle offered some really great opportunities. Uh, one of the sort of the folk 
uh, etymology. The folk tale as to why Sephardic Jews came to Seattle was because Seattle reminded them of the Mediterranean or of the Marmara Sea. Obviously, right. they came in the summer. They had no idea, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> what they were doing. Um, but, uh, you know, they could also get involved in some sea-related businesses, like fishing business. This was something familiar to them. Sponge diving was one of the main occupations of some of the Jews on the island of Rhodes. And when that industry went bust, many of them started to look for other opportunities. Now, the second part of the question is about what happened. Why is now Seattle right. number three and not number two? Has to do a little bit with about how we define what Sephardic means. Um, so Sephardic Jews, the, as a category, uh, has come to mean Jews who live in or come from anywhere other than like Europe. Um, so the strict definition would be Jews who trace their ancestry to Spain. Um, but in, in our Eurocentric world, uh, Sephardic has also come to describe Jews from all other parts of the world. So this would include Persian Jews. It would include Jews from Arab-speaking provinces, some of whom may come from Spain originally, but not. And what we see happening is in the last 50 or 60 years, Jews from some of these other countries, Iran, for example, huge Iranian Jewish, Persian Jewish community in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so if we count those as part of our understanding of Sephardic, then yes, Los Angeles has a way huge, a way much larger Sephardic community than Seattle. But if we, uh, and, and, and few of those new immigrants from Arab-speaking countries, uh, Jews from Arab-speaking countries were expelled after 1948, uh, about 800,000 of them, many went to what became Israel. Some of them trickled into the United States, but uh, few of them, relatively few of them, came to Seattle. So demographically, Seattle didn't get that big boost mm -hmm. like places like Los Angeles did yeah. in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this, this one is about the social acceptance among race and ethnic groups in the Ottoman Empire versus the US. I mean, how important was race as a concept, and the Ottoman Empire, I think, is the... Yeah. I mean, I, you know, ra they didn't know about race, really, in the Ottoman Empire until much later. You know, if, if for example, you take some of the sultans um, married Christian, like Balkan Christian queens and things like that, so a lot, of the, a lot of the sultans' mothers were actually what we would now call Greeks or Bulgarians, mm -hmm. and that by you know, 19th century definitions would have been an interracial kind of dynamic. That wasn't really, you know, relevant for the Ottoman Empire, and it didn't pose, it didn't really pose a problem. And it's for the same reason, you know, the Ottoman Empire presented itself as sort of an ecumenical kind of empire, both for, for, for Christians and for Muslims and for Jews. And so these, these concepts of race, you know, were, were, were not really the most defining features of, um, of the empire. Uh, you could, if you were from what we now call a different race or a different national group, you could convert. Okay, you still have to convert because religion was really the litmus test. You, you could convert, but you could become the prime, the the grand vizier, mm -hmm. if you you were a Balkan, you know, you were a Christian, uh, Balkan person. You could you could become the uh, grand grand vizier if you were, you know, an African, for example. You have have black skin. You could become one of the very important figures. In the in the sultan's sultan's palace, and even into into modern times, like I sort of alluded to this in the discussion of the Armenian genocide, which was you could you could you could stop being Armenian, right? And 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 that's something that in a racial framework you can't do, like because race is immutable. Like if you are if you have a racialist or racist kind of framework, if you are Jewish, you, like that's what happened in, in, Nazi, in Nazi Germany, for example, you could convert, you could do this, you could do that, it didn't matter. If you were born Jewish, you were born part Jewish. If you had one quarter Jewish background, you were Jewish according to that racial definition. But in the case of the Armenian genocide, you could get out, I mean this is not, doesn't make it good or justified or anything like that, it's just a different dynamic at play, but you could, you could stop, you could prevent yourself from getting murdered if you converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. Protestant and Catholic Armenians were exempt from deportation. If you were Armenian, Armenian, Armenian belonging to the Armenian Apostolic Church, you were the subject of deportations. 
And um, so you know, a few did it, maybe 20,000 converts. And, and actually, there were a lot of uh, the middle classes, the professional classes, doctors and businessmen and lawyers and professionals, were encouraged by their Muslim neighbors to convert because, first of all, they didn't want their friends to be killed, but they needed that piece of the social economic strata of their society. I know you lose a million Armenians, you lose a very important part of the economics and of the social fabric of that society. And so in some ways, you know, religion continued to trump race, even once race became introduced into that realm. Okay. Well, we've worked you very hard, so thank you very much.